From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The Supreme Court hears from a Christian designer who wants to opt out from creating same-sex wedding websites as Raphael Warnock defeats Herschel Walker in the Georgia Senate runoff. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnist Kim Strassel and editorial board member Mene Ukwe-Barua. Welcome to you both. The case that the Supreme Court heard on Monday is called 303 Creative, and it involves a Colorado web designer named Lori Smith, who does not currently create websites. She says she would like to add that as a line of business, but she would like to state up front on her own page that she will not create wedding websites for same-sex couples because that would compromise her Christian witness. And the tension here is with Colorado anti-discrimination law, which says that businesses that are open to the public can't discriminate based on disability, race, creed, color, sex, sexual orientation, marital status, national origin, or ancestry. So let's start with a couple clips of the justices sizing this up. And here to begin on one side is Justice Sonia Sotomayor. This would be the first time in the court's history, correct, that it would say that a business open to the public, as this petitioner has said it is, that it's open, a commercial business open to the public, serving the public, that it could refuse to serve a customer based on race, sex, religion, uh, or sexual orientation, correct? Yes. And you're taking a different view is Justice Brett Kavanaugh. You say that hairstylists, landscapers, plumbers, caterers, tailors, jewelers, and restaurants ordinarily wouldn't have First Amendment free speech right to decline to serve uh, a same-sex wedding, at least that's how I read uh, that reference in your brief. But you say artists are different, um, like publishing houses. And I think the other side, I'll hear from them, but agree that artists are different uh, because of the First uh, Amendment rights that artists uh, possess. But then, at least as I read the briefs, the case comes down to a fairly narrow uh, narrow question of how do you characterize website designers? Uh, are they more like the restaurants and the jewelers and the tailors, or are they more like uh, you know, the publishing houses and the other uh, free speech analogs that are raised on the other side? Kim, this is not the first time that the Supreme Court has been faced with this tension between laws that protect people in the marketplace and the constitutional protections for religious exercise, and in this case, free speech. But how do you size up this argument that the court heard on Monday? Well, let's say just to start with that it's great that the Supreme Court is actually taking this by its horns, as it were, because back in 2018, we had another case, as you mentioned, also in Colorado involving a man named Jack Phillips, who was a baker, and he did not want to make cakes for same-sex weddings. And he ultimately won that, but it was on very narrow grounds because it had to do with the abusive behavior of the state civil rights commission toward him more than it did speech. So now this time we're actually addressing the question of what qualifies as speech and how do the rights of those artists or creators measure up against these state laws saying you cannot refuse service certain categories of individuals. Here's what this comes down to in the problem. And I think the word here that matters is custom. She wants to do custom wedding websites and she wants to state up front that she does not want to do them for same-sex weddings because this would get in the way of her Christian witness. Now, the people who are claiming that she must serve everyone are trying to skirt around this a little bit by saying, well, you know, you can create all you want and say what you want. If you want to make a website that quotes scripture and says that weddings should only be between a man and a woman, you can do that, but you have to sell them to both sides. You have to sell them to people who don't agree with that, people who do. You have to make it available to every customer. But the problem there, again, is the word custom. She could certainly make website designs that said something like that. But of course, same-sex couples wouldn't want her services to do that. And so the question here is her ability to 
create specific designs that tell couples stories, but not do so in a way that violates her religious freedoms. And you kind of can't step around that in the end. And this is what the Supreme Court is going to have to wrestle with. To me, it seems like a very small thing, especially given that there is such a huge market out there for people who do create custom wedding websites, that it isn't as if the folks wanting this are going to be shut out of that market if she is one person who chooses not to do so. To zero in on this point that Kim's making about the custom nature of this, Lori Smith is saying in her brief that Colorado's law, if it applies to speech. Here's a line would force democratic artists to design posters promoting Republican events, compel environmentalist designers to create billboards denying climate change, require Hindu calligraphers to write flyers proclaiming Jesus is Lord. And the Colorado response to this in their brief, which I find pretty unsatisfying, as Kim describes, is that that's not the case, that if the Hindu calligrapher decides to make a piece of art saying Jesus is Lord, the calligrapher simply has to agree to sell that to all comers. And so here's the line from the Colorado brief that really sticks out to me. The company can define its services however it wants, including offering only websites that include biblical quotes describing marriage as the union of one man and one woman. But the company must sell whatever it offers to customers, regardless of their race, religion, sexual orientation, or other protected characteristics. The company cannot refuse to sell services, however limited to a customer just because of who they are. Both believers and atheists can choose to buy a website with biblical quotes. That seems like a little bit of a dodge to me, given the custom nature of what Lori Smith wants to do, which is to sell these websites that authentically tell the wedding love story of the couples that are getting married. Yeah, I agree. I think that that argument from Colorado is frankly very cynical. They are basically creating an example that clearly does not apply to Laurie Smith, the individual at hand here. And you could imagine possible cases in which the line of argument they're making would be germane, where you do have somebody who basically is making a repeatable product and selling to the masses, even if they might have strong religious convictions or other personal convictions. If you're creating a standardized product like that, the law suggests that you have to be open to selling to all customers. And that's true, for example, Christian publishers. They don't prevent people who disagree with them from purchasing their books. But in the example of someone who's creating custom websites, as you said, She basically wants to defend herself against having to tell a love story about a gay couple that she wouldn't agree with. Writing that and sort of lending her creative talents to that endeavor, in her view, would be a violation of her conscience. And I think, as Justice Kavanaugh said, there is a legal distinction between whether a person can be compelled to make certain expressions or whether they just have to be open to receiving all customers. So that distinction is important. I do think it stands noting that there will be edge cases and the Supreme Court's going to have to come up with a standard that does sort of draw the line of what counts as art, what counts as speech, what counts as expression. But I think in the case of a custom website, it's very clear that the creator of that is literally speaking, they're literally expressing their views in doing so. And so the religious liberty protections should apply. It does bear pointing out, though, that Lori Smith does say in her brief again that a client who identifies as a gay asked her to design graphics for his animal rescue shelter or to promote an organization serving children with disabilities, Smith would happily do so. And then she also says that she will decline other requests for speech that she disagrees with, that contradicts the truths of the Bible, demeans and disparages someone, promotes atheism or gambling, endorses the taking of unborn life. So she's saying she would also decline to make a Planned Parenthood website for the sake of argument. And so in her mind, in her argument, it's about the speech that she is creating and facilitating through her website design. The point about speech that Monet was making, that some line has to be drawn somewhere, I think is also worth discussing a little bit, because in the Jack Phillips case, that was about cakes. And if you go back and look at the oral argument, there were a lot of questions from the justices if cakes count as speech, if custom cake design counts as free speech under the First Amendment. Then what about a hairdresser or a makeup artist? Justice Elena Kagan said, what about a makeup artist? I mean, it says artist right in the title. But to me, the websites are on the other side of the line. And along with stuff like speech writing, ghost writing for books, I don't think anybody thinks that 
the state of Colorado could force someone who puts out a shingle and says, I'm a speechwriter, I'll help people with speeches, to write speeches that they disagree with, Kim. This is going to be, in the end, a discussion about what counts as artistry or free speech and how those two intersect. It's a very complicated question. And again, I think it goes back to my point that this seems like a small accommodation in a country where historically we've tried to balance off the these rights between people's belief in their own religion, their rights to free speech, and also other people's right of access to certain products and services. And we've managed to do this successfully in the country in the past, but the vice seems to be tightening. And we're now having all these cases that are demanding that the Supreme Court deal with this tension and come up with some sort of bright line. Now, that may prove very difficult to do. And I would argue that unless the Supreme Court is very clever here, and maybe it will be, to come up with the contours of of what encapsulates artistry, what encapsulates free speech. This could be just the first case in many that we see come in front of the court in which that definition has to be tightened or dealt with again, because this is just, again, it's a very, very complicated question of definitions. I would go back, though, one more time. The other thing that I think is a bit cynical in the Colorado brief, to use Monet's word, the other argument they make is that essentially Ms. Smith is becoming a monopoly, that because she is a monopoly of websites in the style of Mrs. Smith, essentially, meaning that if you want her particular services in this particular case, you can't get them and therefore you've been shut out of the market. Well, that simply isn't true. There's a huge market, obviously, for website designs. And this idea of choice has always been the kind of grease that helped in the past in these complicated questions and allowed us some sort of accommodation. By arguing that she is essentially a monopoly of one, that's just a false definition of what the market is out there. And I think that question is also probably going to end up playing into whatever decision is finally made. And on the choice point, I mean, classic public accommodations are things where there's a captive market, like restaurants, trains, hotels. And there are a million website designers and nobody is restricted. If you live in Colorado from working with website designers down the block, you can work with one anywhere. And to the point that Kim makes about historical religious liberty respect in the United States, I mean, there's a 1943 case in the middle of World War II. The Supreme Court said that the children of Jehovah's Witnesses would not have to salute the U.S. flag at school. At the same time, there were pacifist churches that had accommodations that kept them out of military service and in alternate service. And so, Manet, I mean, I think that there's a lot of heat over these conversations we've had in recent years about wedding cakes and websites, but I think you have to stack that up against the religious liberties that the United States has historically respected. Yeah, I do think that as context for this case is essentially the civil rights movement. And people look to the changes in the law that were made, particularly the Civil Rights Act that allowed minorities to take place in the public square openly. And in doing so, did restrict some of the privileges of rights of of business owners, freedom of assembly, for example, if you're a store owner. And so I think a lot of progressives today say we're basically doing the same thing. We're kind of extending that public accommodation to gay and lesbian people. And I sympathize with that view. But I do think that the objections that the Christian business owners today have to the kinds of service that they're being asked from, from some of these customers who might be gay or lesbian, would require them to violate their own kind of freedom of expression in a way that's very different from somebody who is operating a hotel and doesn't want to serve minority customers. Again, the the core of the matter is, are you being required to violate something that has been protected historically as a core right? And expression of your religious views is something that has historically received that. 